That looks great, yeah. Next Saturday from 12 till 3 is our pumpkin, uh, our free King Pumpkin Patch. So we hope you all can uh, uh, make it uh, to either help, come and see what we're doing, con connect with the community, just be, uh, just see how it goes. This will be our first time doing this. So we'll be really excited to have you here. And if you even want to get here around 10, you could even get some little exercise and help us carry pumpkins outside. So that will be a, a big help for, uh, for those that are doing the pumpkin patch. But anyways, good morning. Welcome to Down River. Also welcome to our online congregation. We're, uh, we're happy to have you today. Uh, my name is Bill Curtis and I'm your host this morning. And we are here at 14400 Beach Daily Road and we are so happy that you're here. Inside or on the back table, you will find a connect card. You're welcome to fill one of those out so you can stay in touch with what's happening at Down River. If you're interested in, in anything in particular, make sure you put that on the connect card and we will get in touch with you. Online, you can fill out a connect card. Um, the website is, was up on your screen just a minute ago. Fill that out, send that into the office, and we'll get you the uh, information about what's going on. On the back of the Connect card is a prayer request. We invite you to fill out a prayer request. We know that, uh, we know that prayers work, and we know our world and our uh, country and our state and our city and our church. We need a lot of prayers, and they work. So fill that out, submit that, and our prayer team prays on all of these prayers every week uh, during their meeting and, the, and also all throughout the week. So be, uh, take a minute to do that. If you're online, you can fill out your 24, there's a 24-7 prayer request line. You can submit a prayer to that as well. We are a very giving church here at Down River. There is a, uh, on, uh, oh, I'm, Sorry, I'm going out of order here. On November 5th, we are having our uh, annual church conference. And I believe that will be here at the, uh, at the church. And everyone is invited to attend. That's where we talk about uh, the leadership of the church, who's on different committees. We talk about what's happening at the church. We uh, approve the pastor's salary. We approve... Uh, the staff salaries. We do a lot of administrative things at the church uh, during that conference. And I believe uh, Reverend Toddy, who is our district superintendent, will be here to uh, host us for that day to guide us through our church conference. So you are all invited to share your input, share your thoughts, and just be part of uh, Down River Church on November 5th. And uh, 415, the SPRC meet, which is really the PRT team, we call it here as People Resources Team, at 415, and then at 5 will be the church conference. So I hope you can make it. Today is Comfort in the Kitchen pickup day, and it's cheesy beef and rice casserole, so don't forget to pick up your meal if you've, uh, if you've decided to uh, uh, put your name down for one. Uh, Lindsay's uh, prepared those and has, has them ready for you to take. Pardon me? Oh, okay, oh, the giving slide. Um, we don't wanna forget that. On the back <laughs> table is an envelope that you will find that you are welcome to put a gift in that envelope and you can submit it into the, uh, the basket. We are collecting uh, money for uh, the mission and missions here, here down at Down River Church. What we do for outreach, yes, it does pay for the heat and pays for the lights and pays for a lot of things in the building. We invite you, if you are able to, to give a gift. We are also taking gifts for our food pantry, uh, UMCOR, you name it. We will take uh, your gifts. The pumpkins um, we purchase from blocks, and uh, we are looking to if you're willing to make a donation to pay for those, to help pay for those pumpkins, that would be great because the pumpkins will be free to the community next Saturday. So um, we're going to have a kids' maze during that time. We're going to have uh, cider and donuts. There'll be pumpkin decorating. It's going to be a lot of fun. 
So I invite you all, like I said, as I said in the beginning, I hope you all can make it. So with that, I will invite Linda up to lead us in this morning's call to worship and scripture. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. Jesus said we should love each other as he loves each of us. God rejoices at our love and compassion for others. Sometimes we let prejudice and fear get in the way. But when we fully confess our sins, God will forgive us. Let us worship God and rejoice in God's love. Let us praise God who forgives and restores us life. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barabbas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that the forces the, that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person, not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not <clears throat> not by the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified now it's time for the kids moment oh but if in seeking to be justified in Christ we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For though the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I am no and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I now live in the body I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law Christ died for nothing And now is our kids moment they please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to stand up here, you guys, uh, because I have like a sinus infection. And so if you guys could, could just stand. Yeah, if you guys could just stand and kind of look at, look at, look towards me a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to teach you guys a prayer today. I know that you probably already know it, but it's a prayer for food. Does anybody know how to do the Superman prayer? Huh? Who knows how to do the Superman? You know how to do the Superman prayer? Oh, yeah, Elaine does. So here we go. I'm going to teach you the first couple stands of the Superman prayer. Ready? Thank you, God, for our food. Thank you, God, for our food. For the friends we meet, for the what we have. <laughs> Thank you, God, for our food. Shh. Now listen. 
Now you guys are going to do it on your own. You ready? You ready? And you got to be really, really loud. I know we have, some, we have a camper counselor in our midst, Desire, my daughter. She knows it too. Uh, so let's go. Are you ready? You ready? Here we go. Thank you, God, for our food. Y'all can help too. Thank you, God, for our food, for the friends we meet, for the food we eat. Thank you, God, for our food. Shh. Woo, I got dizzy. <laughs> you know, we should have did something er, um, before we did that. Do you guys like McDonald's, like French fries? Yeah. You, you like? She eat. <laughs> you eat McDonald's every day? Yeah. No? Okay, well, I have a gift for you today. In the first row to my left, on the first row under some pumpkins is a gift card for McDonald's. But you can't get two or three gift cards. You can only get one. So if you would help them, Lindsay, find their gift cards for McDonald's, it's under the first row of pumpkins. You guys, look. Go, go get your gift card. And you can, yeah, look under one of those. You got one? That's one for you. That's one for you. There, yeah, there you go. There's some more. There's some more. Did you get one? Yeah. There. Yeah, there's one. There's one over there. Yay! All right. I bet you next time when I call for children to come up, I get some adults. <laughs> so you guys have fun today. We'll be praying for you. And remember the golden rule, always say, Pastor John, two cookies. They're packed already? They're in my office already? <laughs> let us stand and let us, uh, let us worship. Uh, we have a couple of songs before our message today. I'm going to hide over here.
a message from our bishop, Bishop David A. Bard. Dear friends in Christ in the Michigan Conference of the United Methodist Church, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our peace and who encourages us to be peacemakers when he says, blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Early in this century, an acronym to describe our changing world gained wide or worldwide currency, D-U-C-A. The world moving into the future is like, likely to be volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This past weekend, the world again experienced voluntary when, um, well, violence when Gaza Hamas fired thousands of rockets into Israel and Hamas fighters from Gaza invaded nearby Israel towns. Over 900 people have been killed and over 2,500 injured. There have been reports of rape and torture and over 130 people, including women and children, have been taken hostage. Much of the world has expressed outrage over these actions for which there are no moral justifications. Let me be clear, these actions are morally unjustifiable and deserve condemnation. It is also true that the historical background is complex. While we cannot uh, let that complexity blunt or moral outrage, we must continue to wrestle with the realities that make peace so difficult and uh, exclusive in Palestine and Israel. Among the realities that make this situation complex are the long histories of both the Palestinians and the Jewish people. These histories include dispossessions, oppression, and deep trauma. Deep injustices have often marked the history of Israel's policies towards uh, the Palestinian people. Recent Israel policies encouraged the ongoing formation of Jewish settlements in Palestine's uh, uh, territory have uh, deepened resentment and injustice. One Israel journalist described the current policies as establishing a government of annexion and dispositions. We, the Israel response, or will the Israel response to this Hamas attack be measured and proportionate it. Thus far, retaliatory strikes have killed close to 700 people. We mourn with those grieving in Gaza. Prior inv invasions from Israel from nearby countries and terrorist bombings are part of this complex history. Among Israel's citizens are survivors of the Holocaust and and family members of those who died during it. Regional policies added to this complexity, including the power struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran and its influence on Israel and Palestine actions. I think we must seek to hold together an ambiguous condemnation of this recent attack. A recognition of the complexities of this region of the world and a deep desire to achieve justice and peace coexist. Our condemnation of these recent Hamas actions does not uh, mitigate our concern for justice for the Palestinian people and concerns uh, supported by our conference resolution last summer. In the name of Jesus, we remain committed to peace. A peace in which Israel and Palestinians coexist and seek to flourish together. The social principles of the United Methodist Church states this, we deplore war and urge the peaceful settlement of disputes among nations. We yearn for the day when there will be no more war and people will live together in peace and justice. Let us pray out of this deep yearning for peace and justice and a better world. As we pray deeply for peace together in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, 
May we also pray for the hearts and minds large enough to grapple with all the complexities that comfort, that comfort us as we pursue what makes for peace. May we remain committed to hearing the following, hearing and following the call of Jesus to all the peacemakers. Bishop, Bishop David Bard. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar is mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is, where are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country skies are bluer than the ocean and sunlight beams on clover, leaf, and pine. But other lands have sunlight too and clover and skies everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, O oh God of all the nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. Amen. Thank you for praying for me. Um, last week, I, uh, I helped the, the, uh, some of the guys um, deliver some of the pumpkins, as you can see. Let's give a round for those guys who came and helped with the pumpkins. Right after that, I got a sinus infection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And... Um, and I was down until today. Today is my first day up. Today is my first day vertical. Today is my first day with the help of my, my loving wife who took care of me through all of those days. I know I got on her nerves. <laughs> I'm sick. I want some juice. I want some water. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Where are you, Nurse Deborah? <laughs> um. Anyway, good morning, church. Good morning. I thank you for praying for me last week. Uh, I am on the men's, and I'm here to praise God with you today because God is good. And all the time, the attack on ourselves and on, our, uh, on, on, and on God's church is real. If we weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing, then nobody would be attacking us. Amen. James 1 and James 1, 2 through 6 says this. The brother of Jesus writes, count it, count it all for joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that in the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let the steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, I need to talk to James about that because I'm not perfect, and I am definitely not complete. Uh, but uh, I thank you for praying for me anyway. I'm trying to move towards that, as everybody is, right? Everybody's trying to move towards that. So we are here to praise the Lord. I, I am hesitant about telling jokes that include er elderly people uh, of the gray heritage, uh, last time I did that was last week, and I got a sinus infection. I was, I, I was wondering if God was, Mike, if God was trying to tell me something. Don't be telling them jokes about the elderly people. So please forgive me, God. My material is very limited. Every day this woman came out of her house, and she stood on her porch, she blurted out into the atmosphere, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And her neighbor just got tired of it because he was an atheist. And he said, oh, there is no Lord. There is no Lord. But she would not miss a day and she would come out and open up her door, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And he just got tired of it. 
So one day she kind of she came out of her house and she said, "Praise the Lord! I'm hungry and I don't have any food. Lord, deliver me some food." And the guy said, "This is my chance to prove to her there is no God." So he ran and he got some food and he packed it all up and he put it on her porch. And the next day she came out. She said, "Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord!" Oh, thank you, Lord. You brought me some food. And he jumped out of the bushes and he said, ha, I told you there was no Lord. I'm the, I'm the one that bought the food. And she looked up and she said, praise the Lord. You sent the devil to buy me some. <laughs> I'm really going to get it for that one. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for women who come out of the house saying, praise the Lord. We give you thanks for this day and all the days awarded to us. You are the author and the finisher of our, of our faith, and we trust you, Lord. Direct our past. Change our minds. and Place us in your ability to love unconditionally. and Spread that type of love wherever we go knowing that you go before us and provide protection as we deliver your word. God, we just thank you for this day and thank you for those that are around us. We are reminded by that prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I always do something where I lose my whole sermon on this thing. Uh, electronics is not my style, so I'm glad I got my nephew Jake here today. I can throw this thing to him and he can get it back up for me. Last week, uh, we read where Paul had planted good seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Galatia. And in Galatia, the church started. Um, we, uh, Paul left and then he came back only to find out that the Jews and Gentiles had been misled into following, remember last week, a different gospel, right? And Paul quickly addressed both sides of the conversation about the law and, and being uh, accepted because of it and grace or adoption and being accepted because of that or being one in Christ. The law taught us how sinful we are and why we need a Savior. Jesus teaches us that he is that Savior. To me, that's simple. Is that not simple to you, church? You can answer. Right, that's simple to you. The Jews thought that the works that, that they did might make them eligible to receive the heavenly gifts of eternal life. That is a gift. You know that, right? Eternal life is a gift. It is given to you not because of what you've done or what you will do, but it is given to you by your faith in Christ. Amen? James, the brother of Jesus, teaches us this. What does it profit, my brother, my sister, if someone says he has faith but not have works? Can faith alone save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, reminds me of the joke, right? And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But that person doesn't give that person in need anything. Then what does it profit? Thus also by faith itself does not have works if faith does not have works, it is dead. This is the brother of uh, Jesus 
giving us this knowledge. And so last week we gave examples of how works without faith is dead. Remember when we talked about Martin Luther with all of his prayers, right? With all of his giving, with all of his sacrifices, with all of the rituals he did, all of the stuff he did to be next to Jesus, all for nothing? It wasn't until the movement of the Holy Spirit that Martin Luther realized that faith in Jesus was what the gospel was all about. The Protestant church was born. It wasn't born out of works. It wasn't born out of faith. It was born out of both faith and works together. The gospel was preached out of the Protestant church. Faith without works is dead. Remember Jesus when he said uh, to the woman who was bleeding for 12 years who touched the hem of his garment? You remember that story? What did Jesus say? Your faith has made you well. I think last week we understood Paul's position of the importance of delivering this type of message to both Jews and to the Gentiles alike on what the true gospel of Jesus Christ was. I think we identified the true gospel with, I, I think maybe one word, love, right? Love. We cited the scriptures out of 1 Corinthians. You remember, love is patient, love is kind. You remember that, that scripture, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud, it doesn't dishonor other, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it, Keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. And out of all these, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these, says the writer, is what? Is love. The greatest is love. Paul loved both the Jews and the Gentiles and believed that in faith in Jesus, there was room for both of them that started the church in Galatia. Paul exhibited, exhibited this love in bringing them both together. In an attempt in the letters of correction to the church in Corinth, Paul describes what that word really means. We all know it to be the epitome of the de definition of those who study the scriptures. Love never fails. Get that, church? Love never fails, ever. So in the last week in our world, we find a world that, that never fails has that word, that love that has never fails, kind of fall, falling short, it seems. In Gaza, thousands have been killed, many taken. Israel, Palestine, a war on the horizon, if not happening at this very moment. And what about in Ukraine and Russia, where troops continue to destroy every ounce of life it comes into contact with? And in the states, our own battles in a legislative, in a judicial, in the executive branch, in our own governments. A pulsating stand-up strike that is leaving companies idle and workers wondering. Our southern borders, controversy on who's in and who's out. And then we come to a church, Universal, who, announce, who announces that some of us are invited in and some of us are not. And then we visit this scripture today in Galatia and we ask ourselves the question, will love fail? Will love fail the United Methodist Church? Will love fail in Gaza? Will love fail in Ukraine? Will love fail on the picket lines right down the street from us and in other states? 
will love fail. I think out of this story today, we can probably gravitate towards that answer. You see, I think in this scripture today was the, 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 the very first, I would like to call it, um, I'm trying to be nice here. It was the very first church fight. <laughs> you guys know this. You know, you, you guys are privy to uh, uh, many a times there were disagreements in the church, haven't you? Right. But this was the first church fight ever. You see, Paul had knew that the Jews that came from Jerusalem, they came with the law. They knew that the law was the only way into heaven because they worshiped Abraham and they knew who Abraham was and they knew that they had begotten from Abraham and Sarah. And the Gentiles knew that they were belonging to Christ because they too were from Abraham, but they were from Abraham and Hagar. You know, Abraham had went out on earth. Well, you guys know that story. Anyway, so they knew that they were belonging to Christ. But the controversy was this. Well, who's in and who's out? Humans really believe that they have a, a, a hold on God's church. And so they're, they're saying, well, you know, I belong to Abraham and Sarah, and I belong to Abraham and Hagar. And so I am the, really the true um, church people to start the revolution of Jesus Christ. And to make matters worse, one of the apostles, Peter, they call him Cephas, if you didn't notice in the scripture, Peter didn't make matters any better. Because Peter, being a Jew himself, was sent out for the Jews to come to Christ. Paul was sent to the Gentiles to come to Christ. But here in Galatia, Peter was found hanging out with the Gentiles. They had a picnic one day, and Peter was hanging out eating barbecue and chips and uh, chicken and all of the stuff that wasn't kosher for Jews. But when the Jews came back from hiking in the woods, Peter pushed away from the table and said, oh, no. I'm a so that made matters worse. Paul called Peter out the very first church fight. And Paul said to Peter, how dare you be one-sided when it's convenient for you to enjoy ribs and barbecue chicken and macaroni and cheese. But then when your people come and they want to eat kosher food, halal meat, then you push away from the table. How hypocritical you are when we are trying to build a church. Paul says this, in attempting to cross culture um, for the sake of the gospel, two entities, the Jews and the, and, the, um, and the Gentiles, Paul is called the great gospel defender. And we are to take on that personification as defending the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. In the story today, everybody's got a problem. In the story back then with Paul, everyone in the church had a problem. Have you ever walked into a room where everybody has a problem? I know, but, you know, we, when you were helping with the kids, right, when you help her with, she, when she walked into the, the teepee and all of the kids were together and she was, you know, uh, uh, doing her thing with the kids, she noticed all of the kids had a problem. Everybody has a problem. But I bet Paul is saying the same thing that Rodney King said back then. Can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? To the Jews, can't we all just get along? You are blessed. You are God's chosen. God has chosen you. Of course, you failed in, in your, your job that you were supposed to do, but God forgave you and bringing you into the fold of Gentiles. 
of course, you are worshiping pagans. And God said, hey, don't worry about that. I know you're not of my lineage, of my blood, but I am adopting you into the fold. Everybody belongs to Christ. So Paul has this culture war going on here with the Jews that wanted to exclude the Gentiles, and the Gentiles wanted to exclude the Jews. Paul shuts everybody down totally with these verses. And I'll close with this because, you know, I'm getting kind of nasally. Paul makes the case for Christ. The church, us, we are called to make the case for Christ. And our Thanksgiving dinners and our Christmas dinners and when we're among our friends, we are called to make the case for Christ. And here it is. Paul said this. Paul, being a Jew himself, saying this. But if seeking to be justified in Christ, and he's looking at the Jews, he says, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not, says Paul. Paul is using this, you know, psychology on him. You know, Paul's pretty good at that. He said, if I build what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, Paul's teaching them now, through the law, I died to the law. Because we all know that the law, the Ten Commandments, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, was just a books or books that identified sin to us. And when we looked at those books, it told us who we were. That's what Paul's talking about. So Paul says, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified, says Paul, with Christ, and I no longer live, but it is Christ that lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Paul makes this case for Christ, and these are his closing statements. He said, if I died, I died in the law. But that's not the end of the story. That means that the law is dead in me so that Christ is risen in me also. Paul is just not pointing to the Jews with this closing statement, but Paul is also pointing to the Gentiles. It's a one symbol that will bring us all together, church. It doesn't matter if you're Presbyterian or Catholic. It doesn't matter if you're Lutheran, if, if you're Methodist. It doesn't matter where you are. If you profess that Christ is yours, then you are in. Somebody can say amen to that. That's it. That's the answer. That's it. Case closed. That makes the case for Christ, the church must not set aside the grace of God for the life I now live. I live by what? By faith in who? In Jesus. The answer for hunger is my faith in Christ. The answer for homelessness is my faith in Christ. The answer for the war between Ukraine and Russia, you know what it is? It's my faith in Christ. Palestinians and Israel can come together through our faith in Christ. The answer for any injustice is our faith in Christ. The church takes the lead. You are all disciples of Jesus Christ that will transform the world. 
So give yourself a hand clap. Amen. God, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for opening up the scriptures to us and, and to let in, letting us know that we are not alone, that we uh, that you have gone on before us and you come after us and you have given us everything that we need, Lord. All we have to do is ask, oh God, and you are there before us. God, and I know there are some people who desire to know you more, more intimately on a personal basis. Lord, I pray for them, Lord, that they, they may come, they may um, uh, uh, just come to you and, and release whatever it is that is on their mind and in their hearts, giving it all to you. Paul said, I died. I died in a law so that I am resurrected in Christ. And that is the case uh, for Christ in our lives. And Lord, we just thank you uh, for this day, for this and we thank you for the healing that you're, you've done in, in my body and, um, and in the congregation. Lord, um, be with us uh, today as we stand and sing our last song. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Give the Lord a hand clap. And we'll go to our, our last song. I so much want to hug you when I come down, but because of my science infection, I cannot. So can you give me some air hugs? <laughs> if I die, I die to the law. And when I die to the law, that means that Christ is fulfilled in me. Go and be fulfilled with that love and that grace, that forgiveness and that peace. Christ is counting on us to be those disciples. 
that will transform this world. Go in peace. May the peace of God go with you all. Amen.